Hey everybody, please, please help join and give our first Atlanta night warm, warm welcome to Team Deacons, James and Roger Deacons. I want to know who's Batman and who's Robin. It's the dynamic, it's the dynamic duo thing. Yeah. So, so now we're in an argument, who's Batman, who's Robin? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so here's how we're gonna try and structure the conversation, because uh, we got a lot to talk about. We're gonna cover career at large, see how well we can squeeze that into the limited amount of time we have. <laughs> uh, we're gonna talk some time about the incredible new book. Hopefully you guys have seen it out in the lobby. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about the film that we're gonna see tonight. Um, but to kick us off, um, first, you know, welcome. You guys are, are an incredible, unique duo. Um, have a, a career spanning 50 years collectively, well over 100 titles um, that you have worked on your own, many of which worked on together. Um, and, and so I, I want to kind of jump in. This is hopefully going to be a little bit of an informal conversation, and we'll never know where it'll go. <laughs> I can borrow from your podcast, which I'll reference later. Um, so first, uh, you know, for those who maybe are more familiar with your work than maybe your history, talk a little bit about, if I could take it to the first episode that you have on your podcast, how you got started, each of you. James, if we could start uh, with you. Well, I, I um, <laughs> in college I majored in Latin and Greek, but never planned to use it, um, which horrified my father. But my first job was in a, a film lab, so I learned all that. It was supposed to be for six months, but it ended up being for four years, and I learned a lot technically. And then I went into being a script supervisor. 
um, which is definitely can be a masochistic choice at times. Um, but I did that, and then Roger and I met on a movie, and I continued doing that for a while, but because the script is a director's choice, oftentimes we were on different movies and we decided we wanted to be together. So um, I stopped being a script, but then I ended up picking up this role of we work, basically work together and work as a team, and um, I oversee the workflow, the dailies workflow, and then um, we work together with production on, on making it happen. Roger? Yeah, um, you got to turn. Yeah, I did. Um, yeah, I came to it quite late, really. I, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. And I went to art college to avoid anything else and um, discovered I like photography. And I felt it gave me satisfaction. I met a couple of people that I thought it kind of inspired me that it was possible to, you know, <laughs> go in that direction as a career rather than, you know, just being a hobby. And um, I was lucky enough, at that point, I was struggling to think what to do, that the National Film School in the UK opened up. And um, I was lucky, I didn't get in the first year, but I was lucky enough to apply the second year and go in. And yeah, I think going to the National Film School changed my life, because I was really a mess before that. <laughs> but uh, I suddenly realized there was something that I really got satisfaction from, I felt confident when I had a camera and when I was looking through a camera, which I wasn't as a person, you know, otherwise. And so in a way I hide behind the camera and I have all my life really. But um, that's why I felt comfortable and I felt I was getting something from it. So I was just very lucky really. James talked about that you met on a film. What, what film, if you can share what film was that? And, and it was Thunderheart and we were up in South Dakota and James had just moved to LA from New York and I just bought a little house in Santa Monica and we found we lived like 100 yards apart. <laughs> so it all, I mean, we worked, we didn't, we had one date on the movie, but James says it wasn't a date. I thought it was a date. We went to Rapid City to watch some movies and have a dinner. I thought it was a date, but she said it wasn't a date, but anyway. Do we need to get into yeah, this? No, sorry, again, personal. <laughs> so, but after, after the movie, we started seeing each other, yeah. yeah All right, I'm going to check in. Otherwise, I'm going to keep stealing their attention and time. Gladly, thanks. Okay, so, um, you know, you, you, you both have a career that's spanned 50 years. It's obviously... Please the, don't. Yeah, about do you that. have to keep repeating that? Uh, but I, I, I'm just thinking about the technology that has changed, the relationships uh, the people that you've started to work with uh, you know I i'm curious over that amount of time what have you hung on to as as habit in terms of of uh, of how you like to work and maybe what has evolved maybe with the most contrast over the years um the most important thing is what you feel about the image it's not about technology it's not about anything else and the most enjoyable thing about being on a film is a collaboration with a load of people that you can count on as your friends, but also as your fellow uh, creators, I suppose. I think it's very interesting too, because people say, oh, well, if you shoot digital, you're just gonna then keep the camera rolling and just do take after take, but that's not true, and that's not the way that we shoot. We shoot, I guess, more in a traditional film way, except I don't, think you should think of it that way because you shoot the take and then you have to stop because you have to reset and everything and um, that idea that digital means you're doing it more sloppily doesn't seem to apply certainly not to us and to other people that we know. Sure. It's funny I think uh, I've certainly find through my career technology has Your actually long sort of career. my long <laughs> 50 odd years of it. Oh god. Um, no, I think it's funny, the technology's always been there when I've kind of needed it. You know, mm. when Joel and Ethan, we were doing Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? We thought that how are we going to get this look that they want? They wanted a sort of painted postcard look. And then we looked and we thought, well, digital finish. 
suddenly that was there. It was possible. I mean, it was hell to do it on that film, but it was there. It was also then, not there at the beginning of the no. film, but you guys had faith that would be right. at that point right. at the end. And that's happened on a lot of things. I'm right up until 1917, some of the shots, some of the, the, the parts of the sequence on 1917 couldn't have been done without a couple of stabili camera stabilizing systems that didn't exist, literally. Well, they didn't exist before that film because we kind of developed a certain, yeah. some of them for that film. So it's the technology has always been kind of advancing in, in, in sort of in, in tune with the wish list in a way, you know, which is interesting. But it's technology is not driving it. It's almost like what you're trying to do, what you want to do, is suddenly the technology is right. coming along with you. It's the bridge that's helping you cross yeah. to where you wanted to get to. Technology is the tool. I mean, and it doesn't matter if it's digital or film. It's like a pencil. It's what you're using to create whatever you want to create. It was funny. Before 1917, when somebody would be talking to us like this, and, you know, and I would say, yeah, you know, as my career, like, I, I've moved the camera less and less. I argue to move the camera less and less. And then suddenly I do 1917 and the camera doesn't stop. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, but it, the, it's all tools, you know. Sure, sure. All right, checking in. It's cool. Oh, yep. No, the second row right over here. Um, you mentioned collaboration. Um, I recall reading somewhere that you mentioned that if you could work with a filmmaker, you would work with Andre Tarkovsky. And I find it interesting because, from what I can tell, Stan this is a very difficult time working with him on the sacrifice. That's a very good point. Yeah, and Badam Yusuf refused to work with him after three, three or four films, so yeah, but I would have loved to work with him. The same with John Pierre Melville, which he was another hero. Of. I, I, I would have loved to have worked with him, but just because it, their, vi their vision as filmmakers, somehow I feel kind of, yeah. That, yeah that, you say that you would have complained the whole time through it. I would have complained it. like hell, yeah. yeah. And I would probably <laughs> argued and, and whatever, but uh, yeah, but I mean, they were amazing filmmakers. Great question. Um, all right, uh, and we'll get to you next. Uh, so I'm curious, in a similar fashion, you know, so these days, um, you know, when you're starting a project, what is something that you always do that's ritual uh, versus what are the things that you're fluid in and, and kind of see how it goes and where it takes you? Well, I don't know. We have a ritual, really. I mean, any project, you know, you read the script. And you and talk you about the script. Yeah, you feel if you relate to it, you relate to the characters and what the script's trying to say. And, and you meet with the director and, and make sure that you're on the same page. But I mean, you know, we've mostly the last few years worked with people that we've worked with a number of times, you know. I mean, if Joel and Ethan were directing a phone, phone book, you'd say, yeah, you know. <laughs> I mean, they'd do something really interesting with it. I'm not sure they will do that, but it would be interesting. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, there's certain people you really trust. Yeah, I, th I, th I do think that the first step is talking with the director and seeing what the director has in mind and then starting that collaborative process of mm -hmm. finding what the look is going to be. So I'm curious in that collaboration, you know, you've worked with so many directors, some of which now multiple times, you mentioned the Coen brothers, Denis, Sam Mendes. Um, how have you noticed those collaborations maybe differ? Um, in terms of the creative workflow, the conversations, the approach? Well, I think there's more similarities and differences oh. in it. And, you know, it's really the kind of director's passion for the project, uh, the amount of effort and concentration they put, it, put into it. And the, 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 so that, like we've been talking about, the feeling of collaboration with the whole crew. I mean, with Joel and Ethan, it's been like working, going back to work with a family, really, because they usually... They usually work with the, the same key core, core crew, you know, so it is like going back to a family, you know. Um, yeah, but it's, you know, they, every director has a slightly different way of working. And I, I mean, Joel and Ethan kind of know about every aspect of filmmaking because that's how they started off. Um, but even though they could do it all themselves without anybody else, I think they love the collaboration and that's why We've enjoyed working with them, really. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I was... <laughs> yeah. 
No, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, and, and, and perhaps they're, they're in a, a class uh, of their own for, for you all with such a long history you've had with them, but maybe could you compare working with Denis versus Sam Mendez? And I can't, you can't really compare people because they're, they're different, you know. Yeah. I mean, I think I've had the best, the most, I don't know, it's, it's, some, I, it's, it's awful for me to say, well, I think I've had the best collaboration with Danny. I mean, I'm not, yeah, that's the I, wrong way I'm to put it. To, yeah, that's get you the wrong way I'm putting yeah, it. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, there's something that I have a, a sympathy with Danny's feeling about filmmaking and what we did t together on three films, I think, was very special. I've got yeah. very, you know, happy memories of that, even if they were hard shoots, you know what yeah. I mean? I mean, like working with Andre Tarkovsky would have been a hell, but on some days it was with Denny, but I think what you're doing is, is um, yeah, very special. And I guess what I'm curious is to maybe get into the nitty gritty of if you're talking about how you're working out a shot or, or talking about how to accomplish something, you know, they're, they're different people, their brains work differently, yet, you know, the common denominator is the two of you. And so I wonder if, if you've seen you know, over here likes red and over here likes blue, and it, you know, not, one, not to say one's better than the other, but. Well, I, I think we tend to work with directors who want to be collaborative. Mm -hmm. We're not that interested in working with people that don't want to do that. Um, and everybody's very different, so the style of working is different. With Denis, we laugh a lot. I mean, we, we have this joke because every time for, when we were doing prisoners here it seemed like every time we got together we had a fire we something we do a barbecue know. and then the house was almost burned down yeah right, <laughs> yeah, right. so um he's actually going to come he's over for barbecue we're, we're ready to do it again yeah. but um you know he has a really great sense of humor um and sam is very much about the story and, and but not that denise not Sure. You know, yeah, I mean, they're different the people. Yeah, different people. And I mean, Sam comes from theater originally, and he still works in theater a lot. Mm. So his process is slightly different with the actors. Mm. We, we might, I mean, it was different on 1917, but on something like Revolutionary Road, it was a very kind of rehearsal driven film. It was very intense rehearsals and concentrate. Where, um, but it's film to film because 1970 is very different because you do an enormous amount of prep. And then when you shoot, it's actually very, very straightforward because you've rehearsed it or you know, you built the sets for the, right. the scene. The actors do know what they're doing it by rope because they've rehearsed it so many times. And then on the other hand, you do a film like Jarhead and okay, that was the first time we worked with him and he said, oh, I don't really want to rehearse, let's just shoot it handheld and shoot it. And that's, well, we had that discussion and that's what we did. And so a totally different approach is depending on the film, not just yeah. the director. And you do change your approach uh, according to the director. And we, we worked on a film with um, John Crowley, uh, the Goldfinch, who is such a wonderful guy and Irish and funny. And he, he makes you joke with him. And at one point I came in and I was talking to him about what I'd seen in the dailies. And then I made a joke with him, and I suddenly thought, I said that to a director? But yeah. he was fine. Brings that out. Yeah. But afterwards, we worked with Sam on 1917, and we were walking through some muddy field after some rehearsal, and I made a joke, and it did not go over well with <laughs> Sam. And I realized, oh my oh, god, I, so you know, you, my, let me not mix my yeah, methods. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Calm down. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, of, I often like to ask. Uh, directors or actors how they like to give or get notes mm -hmm. because so many people have different preferred style and, and you know there's I think I think you you may have mentioned uh, in, in a previous podcast conversation that perhaps second only the director the cinematographer is the one who's kind of experiencing something similar and is a collaborative partner in that way and so that's you know what I'm curious about is the things that we'll never hear about other anywhere else which is like what are those how are those conversations going uh when you're talking about problem solving when you're talking about what's working or not working or a new idea that comes up or well a uh, lot of times if there's a problem you figure out the solution first before you go and tell them what the problem is how do you mean the problems with doing a, sh a shot or a scene oh, yeah or sure or just you know if you're running into surprises or things like that like how 
you know, what's the, what's the, what's the director cinematographer equivalent of giving and getting notes and, and how is that conversation and, you know, that, that intimacy that we're rarely ever privy to. I don't know. I don't know. It would just be an awful question. Really. Right? I mean, yeah. Yeah, all right. I'm not, not he probably has a better question, so let's go to him. <laughs> <laughs> your turn. Yeah, I did for a while, but that was a while ago. I mean, we wrote wrote a couple of things and went to, yeah, went to a couple of studios, did the whole bit one time. Yeah, Roger hates pitch meetings. Yeah, I hate, well, I hate pitch okay. meetings because there was one script we had which was about two young girls in the Amazon, right? And, we and they were like 10 years old, yeah. 11 or 12 year mm. girls. It was based on a true story. They got lost in the Amazon jungle, and it was meant to be their exploration of the jungle. So through them, you want the audience to experience what the Amazon was like. And so I went to this pitch at a certain studio with a certain person. And they said, yeah, it'd be great though, but um, we've got this actress. And uh, they mentioned her name and she said, well, put this actress in. She's she like 24. She's like, well, <laughs> not even that. She was like 20 or something. And then this guy said, yeah, she looked great in a wet T-shirt. And, and I was out the door. And I just like, oh, please. I, I, but I'm, 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 you know, I did consider it for a while and there was a couple of projects. And, but then, you know, I'd get offered shooting something with Joel and Ethan or something else. And I, I'm just so happy shooting. And that feels, that's, that feels right for me, really. In another life, maybe I'll try and be a director when, I was, when I'm 20 or something, now that I know what I know. But uh, you know what I mean? All right, let's, let's take another one. Yeah, right there. Um, what was the biggest lesson that you guys took away from your first film job? <laughs> on the first film job, the first day on the set, was the first feature film I did, the first day on the set, I've told this story a lot, so I can tell it. <laughs> I, 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 I turned, on the, turned up on the set early because I, I kind of wanted to figure out what the what I was thinking about, how to light it and stuff. And there were two guys standing on the set and one was saying to the other, who's this effing kid from the National Film School who's shooting this film? And the other guy said, oh, I don't know. And the guy said, the guy said well, he's gonna last a week and he thinks he's gonna operate the camera himself. This is ridiculous. Anyway, they were going on like this for a while. I'm standing in the corner and they stopped and they turned around and said, who are you? And I said, well, I'm that effing film school student, actually. <laughs> and uh, I said uh, I, to the, one was the assistant director, the other was a carpenter. I said to the assistant director, can you send a PA to get some aspirin? I've got a headache. And then I said to the, the carpenter, I said, I need a beam put up here because I need to hang some lights on it. They went off and I went round the back of the set to be sick. <laughs> And I learned from that very much. It's always going to be like that. Don't worry about it. <laughs> My f very first set was um, with a director that had previously only shot porn. And you can never take the porn out of the director, I learned. <laughs> and there was... Um, he was in a pitch meeting later on about an Amazon story. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right, right. Yeah. And um, the AD was completely high on coke all the time and was crazy and screaming all the time. Uh, and the producer was a great guy and who had convinced me to do this. And he would come on the set in the mornings and he had these big Dixie cups of something that he gave to the director and the AD. And um, I just knew I had to make this work somehow because I just needed the information. So unfortunately, I did 
make it work so the guys would talk to me and everything. So I became part of the group. So a Dixie cup came out to me every morning and it was vodka. And I kept pouring it into the plants and I did learn that you can kill plants with vodka. <laughs> so that's what I learned. <laughs> uh, those, those were the days when a director came screaming at me once I was on the camera and said, we, we, you know, we need a reload on the magazine. We need a reload. And I went to the loader. I said, what's that, what's that bit delay? The director's going mad. And the, the, <laughs> the loader said, well, I can't get in the dark room. There's a big bouncer there and somebody's in there cutting lines of coke. <laughs> those, those were the days. <laughs> you only had a nickel. Well, also on, on my movie, the AD who was so high on coke, he would do the slate too. And they could never sync it up because it kept, we kept doing that. So the, so the this is I, not what we should be talking. The moral of the story. Control. The moral of the story is less coke on your productions. <laughs> Maybe not no coke, just less coke. Um, no. I, but speaking of, of prior projects, um, I'm curious: um, are, are there ones that have stuck with you and shaped you? And I imagine to an extent, maybe so many of them have. But what I really am thinking about is... In a good way. In a good way. Okay. Or, or bad way. So, for instance, like, oh, we, we've tried this. I love this. Whenever we can do that again, I want to gravitate towards that. Or never want to do that again, ever. Um, so I'm curious if there's any, any particular projects, one way or another, that maybe jump out in memory that you Not sort really of remember. technically. I mean, because, like, every project, it's like starting anew. And to be serious about that joke I was telling about in the first, first film I was on, what I learned from that is like, I'm always going to be stressed. I'm that kind of person. And I, I, it's not any different now going on to set the first day. I'm still stressed. And I wouldn't necessarily be strict. But, you, but now I realize that's part of the territory. You know, it comes with a job. But there are things that in, like in Jarhead, when you did the oil rig and... and and you, the fire, and you had a, a light source, and then in visual effects made it a fire. We took that into 1917 for the burning. Yeah, we church. took it also into Skyfall, and so yeah. there's little techniques, oh, yeah, right. you know. But the again, house. that's that's the development of technology that comes along. And sure. one, it's going hand in hand. I'm not sure which is coming first, the idea or the technology, because yeah, right. that was we couldn't have done Jarhead without the idea of replacing my light with a, a, a flame that we'd shot in the desert. And then in Skyfall, we did the same thing with a, the burning uh, Skyfall Lodge at the end mm -hmm. that we'd shot an element to replace the lights. And then, um, yeah, in 1917, there's this great big cathedral on fire, but obviously it wasn't there. Right. Question now. I'm just curious, we were talking about uh, the collaboration with the director. When you first sign on for a project, what do you expect of the director, especially in terms of like the materials that uh, dictate the visual style, and what do you want to decide and provide for the visual style? Well, I think when you first meet with the director, you want to check to see whether you're both viewing it the same way. And sometimes a director we met on something that was a very, very strange script, but could have been really wonderful. But in order to do it, you'd really need, in our opinion, you'd need to think ahead of time and figure out what, you know, how, how are you going to shoot it? And so I asked him, I said, so are we going to plan this out ahead of time? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then we're going to shoot a whole lot of stuff and decide in the editing room. So you kind of, figure right from the start that that's, you're coming with two different viewpoints and so that probably won't work. Yeah, I will go back to Andre Tarkovsky and Melville, <laughs> you know, I mean, they're both directors that use single cameras and they kind of considered what the shot was and there was only one shot at a time, you know. And when I first started shooting mm -hmm. with Joel and Ethan on Barton Fink, we would shot a compass, shoot a conversation like this, but we'd only shoot the wide shot and the dialogue on the wide shot or oh, the dialogue they wanted for the wide shot, and they would move in and shoot the dialogue they wanted for the coverage. So wouldn't they wouldn't the run thing. the whole scene on a wide and then separate shot. Now, now it's different, but um, that, that, that there's a sort of precision to the way of working, and I've been 
I won't mention the names, but there's a couple of directors I really admire and I would love to work with, but I could never work with because they work, the way they work, I know wouldn't, we just wouldn't get on, you know, they're like multiple cameras and, and, and all the rest. And I, I'm, you know, I'm somebody that I like to operate myself and I like a kind of intimate set and I like films that are kind of intimate, even if, you know, you might think Blade Runner is a big movie, but still it's an intimate film about one character, really, mm. you know, ultimately. Um, uh, I'm keeping an eye on time and making sure we're covering ground here. Um, you guys, for the last few years, have had this incredible, lovely podcast, Team Deacons. Any, any Team Deacons uh, pod <laughs> listeners? You've had something pushing 200 episodes, um, mm -hmm. a variety of incredible conversations with both people you know and have a long history with and people who uh, maybe you met just at the beginning of that conversation. Um, so some of the things that you talk about is the relationships that are important and you know it is it is who you know and things like that and how you've built those relationships and I'm curious um, could could you think of three people maybe just three that have made a profound impact on you professionally creatively and talk about how you met each of them well I think the probably one of the greatest film directors in the world today, and probably has ever lived, is Andre Svigintsev, who directed uh, *Loveless* and um, *Leviathan*, and *Leviathan* and Elena, the Russian director, right? Who we did a podcast with. It's two episodes. We did it with an interpreter, and then. Was it last summer or, yeah, last? Yeah, last uh, November in Paris. It, it, yeah, we, yeah. Went, we went to Paris and he's now living in Paris and we met him and had lunch with him and his family and it was amazing. It was like we were old friends but we'd only done this Zoom call, you know, with right. an interpreter. But now he's living in Paris, his English was pretty good and uh, it was wonderful to meet him. So I, that was a highlight, I think. Um, James, anyone come to mind? I don't know. I, I, I mean, I think Joel and Ethan, it's fascinating to um, see their process and um, I guess really see how they, they have a concept and they, they sort of stay true to that concept. Uh, and, and you read their scripts. When when I read Fargo, I said to Roger, come on, how can you see a movie with this guy that's so despicable? But of course, then they, they um, cast Bill Macy and you feel so sorry for him. So they're constantly, <laughs> yeah, and, and so you, you do watch it, but they constantly come up with these things that aren't always on the written page. So sure. I find them fascinating and, and what they come up with next. And how did you guys meet them? You met them. Well, I, I'm, I met them in Notting Hill in London and um, <laughs> they were looking, they wanted to shoot Barton Fink, which, and they were shooting at non-union in LA. So they were basically, I only found this out years later that they were looking for a, uh, a British cameraman, probably because I wasn't in the union and everything. <laughs> so I was very lucky. <laughs> and one more to close us out. Because um, what I'm so curious about is where that relationship that becomes so important, how it starts, it happenstance and introduction, uh, you know. Well, we met Denis, for instance. Mm -hmm. We. Um, oh, yeah. The this big producer called me up and said, will Roger get, um, present, because before the award, Academy Awards for Foreign Films at that time, they were having a little gathering and they present the nominee um, certificate. I said, oh, I don't know, I'll ask Roger. And Roger went, no. So I called him back, I said, no, I'm sorry. He says, no, no, nah, come on, James, you have to convince him, you have to convince him. So. I went back, I convinced him, so I came back, and it was a year that um, Suzanne Beer had something, and I said, can we do her film? He goes, no, but I promise I'll give you some, someone good, so he gave us Ensemble, 
we watched all Sandy and thought it was great. We immediately do what we always do is, what else has he shot? So we looked sure. at um, the other stuff that he shot, and one was Maelstrom, which starts with, you're looking down on a uh, butcher block and a, a fish gets thrown on the butcher, butcher block. A big cleaver comes in, cuts off the head, and then you hear Tom Vo uh, Waits' voice speaking, and we go, now, where the hell is he going to go with this? And he did. I mean, it was a really interesting movie. So I find, I forget what the question was, but well, he was pretty then, interesting. Then yeah. we met him because we introduced him at oh, the right, Academy. Right, yeah. And then, you know, like a few months later, he's doing prisoners, prisoners in yeah. Atlanta. And but there's so many people. I mean, I got so many wonderful memories of people. I mean, I was very lucky to work with Bob Rafelson. Five Easy Pieces and, right, and right. King of Marvin Gardens. I mean, I, to me, one of the great filmmakers, the Ooh, so his company produced um, uh, that Bogdanovich film, Last Picture Show. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I was lucky to work with him and get to know him. I mean, that was magic, you know, and we kept in touch. I didn't work with him again, although I offered me a couple of things, but I never worked with him again, but we kept in touch over the years, and I, just magic. Let me show some love to this, uh, and the, all the way in the back in the middle, yeah. Yeah, you, with, yeah, stand up, that's you, yep. <laughs> no, no, back there, yeah, she, she's up. <laughs> It's all right. We can hear you. Go for it. Thank you. Um, how do you consider and determine what shots you're going to get for a set that hasn't been built yet? Well, I mean, <laughs> you do that completely. I mean, uh, how do you, well, how do you conceive anything, you know? kind of you imagine something and then you start drawing things together usually. I mean like when I first worked with Joel and Ethan because they didn't know me and I didn't know them we had like five weeks just sort of drawing storyboards together and um, you know it varies because sometimes a director will do a drawing and the set is based on that drawing. Um, we kind of did that with Denny on Blade Runner, really. And also the production and designer is in so yeah. early on a yeah. film that there's some idea of what the set's going to be. Yeah, it's all been done in sync, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly had to be on 1917. I mean, all, everything was designed with kind of the shot in mind. So it's chicken and egg, really. It's not you're not designing the shot around the set. You're, you're designing the shot and then the building the set around a shot. I mean, yes, if you're shooting on location, maybe you're figuring out the shot on location, but usually you're doing location scouts and looking for a location that fits the scene and the feeling of the scene shot-wise that you've got in your head. So, you know, it's like an interplay between the both, really. I don't, I don't, I can't think of many films, and maybe only Sid and Nancy, where you kind of go into a location and that's it, shoot it as it is, you know? Without, without having choices of locations. Thank you. I'm trying to, we're trying to mix it up here. Yeah, in the back there. Yep. Well, you just have to read them quickly, you know. And um, uh, it's interesting because when we first worked with Denis, we were doing prep and doing all these things, and we were getting closer and closer to the shoot date. And um, there was a problem about getting a crane or something, and Roger was stomping around and was kind of pissed off. And Denis came up to me and said, James, James, can I speak to you for a minute? And I thought, uh-oh, what have I done? And I said, okay. And we went into the office. He said, I cannot ask Roger this, but I know I can ask you, is he mad at me? And I realized, <laughs> that's good, that he was able to ask that. And um, so I think 
a lot of times we work that kind of persona up where they can ask me the question that they're afraid to ask you. Yeah, but I mean, you've got to judge. I mean, it's even more important, actually, with actors. You've got to judge what they mm. want. And I, I, I say, I operate the camera. So especially when we were shooting film before the video assisted and all that, you really had to read an actor and what the actor wanted from you as an operator. And even now with video assist, sometimes you get, you, get to understand the, the, the actor wants your reaction to his performance often. Uh, and then there's other actors don't want anything to do with you and they would rather you had a black cloth in front of you. You, you, you know, uh, Morgan Freeman, for instance, will be chatting with you until the board's gone, gone on and then he'll be into his character. You just got to kind of like, you, you, everybody's different. You've just got to figure that what that, you know, how they are. Yeah. And everybody has different days. I mean, the day James is talking about the joke with Sam, and Sam was in a bit of a huff. <laughs> but I mean, other times it would and have I been... I didn't help it. Other <laughs> times it would be fine, you know what I mean? But it's, it's like, oh, every it's, day is different. I think in movie making, it's very much reading the room, too, because yeah. someone can walk, a director can walk on the set in a bad mood that day and, and keep your jokes to yourself. Um, but. And it's true with actors, and I find with actors, I always kind of err on the safe side. But when we were doing Empire, I thought Toby Jones just, you know, wanted to focus and all of that. And so I, I stayed away from him. And then I realized when we were doing a day in that set and we were just going on and on, and he was walking by himself, and I felt like nobody's talking to him. So I, I just walked up to him for, and for the first time started speaking to him and I realized that's what he needed. He was feeling alone on the set. So it's just mm -hmm. looking and, and picking up people's signals and trying not to get it wrong. And then realizing actually that everybody on the set, if they've got a passion for what they're doing, they're as nervous as you are. Yeah, and you know, it's really hard sometimes to think that way about yeah. actors because when we were doing Blade Runner and doing the camera tests, we had Ryan, and I hadn't met, maybe I said hello to him, but I didn't really know him, and he was up against a blue screen, and we were doing these big wide shots, and then we'd go in to check uh, wardrobe or something and come in, and then they had pulled out the camera, and it was another one of the big wide shot, and he was in the frame all alone, and everybody went off there to talk about it, and all I looked up and I saw this frame of this one single person there, and against my better ju judgment, I went over to him and stood beside him and I said, you know what, I'm gonna stand beside you because you look so alone. And it broke the ice between us, um, which worked that time, but if he was one of those method actors, he would not have been happy. <laughs> <laughs> I wanna shift gears a little bit and uh, talk for a second about the book, oh, Byways. Yeah. Um, incredible, gorgeous book that initially you had such success sold out of all of them and had to make another run, right? So um, we've like on our seventh or eighth reprint. That's amazing. Yeah. It's incredible. Um, yeah, we, we can clap for that. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm hoping um, we'll chat a little bit and then I want to kind of do a, a little bit of mini lightning round for some of the images mm -hmm. um, that we have here. So first, tell us why black and white? No, I just always loved black and white. I mean, I think the photographers I grew up with that I really admired um, shot black and white, you know, um, you know, Bill Brandt and all those people. Um, now it's different. There's Harry Griot and there's Alex Webb and they do fantastic work in color. But I've only, I've, I, I think even in my film work I see in black and white. I know you're going to watch a black and white movie tonight, but no, I, I see in black and white. I see in, I see in sort of frame and and light, I think that's, yeah, first. And I, I think color can sometimes be a real distraction. You've got to be very careful with color. And I don't think we've really, I don't think cinematography and has really got into the psychology or whatever of color and to help tell stories. Not the way that somebody like Alex Webb has or Harry Greer on the stills world, you know? So um, I've got some other questions about the book at large, but I want to kind of start on a, on a few images. And if, and if this was a gallery opening uh, and we would have an artist talk on the first night, we'd get to hear a little bit of the stories behind some of the images that maybe aren't self-evident. So can you tell us a little bit about, 
about this set. I was at Ilfracombe, I think it was probably outside the Crown Pub in Ilfracombe in 1971 or 72, and the Salvation Army used to play outside the pubs on a Sunday. And uh, that was it. I think they were trying to stop people go in, but they didn't really want to do that. And then I just noticed they were going home, and I loved the little kid carrying the thing, and it's got his, uh, got the instruments. It, little things, you know. I was just, uh, yeah, I think they were both in Ilfracombe, not the same day, but, I, you know, this was when I was kind of working in North Devon for an art center. And, and so this is, you know, you, you've, you've spoken before about how kind of your work in photography started with uh, having this assignment of documenting life. Um, and so can you, can you place us a little bit re relative year of when this is? That's what I say, it's 1971-72. It was over the winter of 71-72. And it was an art center. They, they wanted to start a, a record of rural life because it was in the 70s, well, post-war up to the 70s, it hadn't really changed and it started really dramatically changing in the late 60s and 70s. So they wanted to just record rural life. When they went on, there was a photographer took over James Revilius, who, who did some fantastic, wonderful work. I mean, nothing, I, I got nowhere near like that, so. What do, you th what do you feel that you get from taking stills versus what you get from, from your film work and, um, and maybe how, what you've discovered ab about yourself in, in the difference of those modes? I don't think I've discovered anything about myself. I think it reflects myself. It reflects yeah. my kind of a little bit of ironic or ironic sense of humor in a way. Mm -hmm. um, I don't take many photographs. It's just those things that sort of touch me in some way. Also, the big difference, and we've talked to some still photographers on the podcast, and they started in film, but they left film because they didn't, couldn't make the decision. It was a collaborative thing, and they wanted to be by themselves and say, yeah, this is the frame, instead of discussing it with five people. Right, right, right. So this is very much my release. I mean, then it was different, but now, I mean, after, you know, even at the end of a day's shoot on a film, I might go off with my still camera. It's my way just to wind down and do my own thing. Yeah, and I, I imagine that's such a different mode from these huge, massive productions. Mm. Is, is do you feel like there's anything while you've done that where you went okay maybe now that I haven't had that 18 other voices in the room and trying to stick to a schedule that I kind of found something that you maybe liked because some of these you had done while downtime during production yeah. and some of these oh, yeah. were you know in between projects altogether so I'm curious if there was ever something that when you're by yourself making your own decisions pressures off you know, there's no story to tell other than the one you discover. If there were maybe things you, went, oh, okay, that's kind of cool. Maybe I want to put that in my back pocket and hang on to that. Oh, what, as a reference to a movie? No, I, I separate the two. No, no, no I just mean, I just mean in, in your, in your approaches or in how you've, because so much. What's fascinating about this book is it makes a nod to your earlier documentary work. It's so observational, and so I, I, I wonder with so much of your professional career being scripted, narrative, you know, what's going to happen is known, more or less. Um, I wonder if maybe continuing to go back to this observational, documentary, almost style work, if that's led into how maybe the longer you've done it, the maybe you've borrowed from that and finding the moment. I think it's always influenced. I mean, I've always done this. I mean, it's always been yeah. that particular side of me. I'm, 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 not, I'm not obsessively going out with a camera every week, or every day or whatever. Sure. I mean, you know, sometimes I go out more often than others. But I mean, it's always been there. So the book just came about by having all these photographs over the years and thinking, well, Let's do something concrete with them, you know. Because yeah. you've never shared them publicly. Really. No. No, they're, I mean, they're sketches. I didn't sure. expect to be here with you having <laughs> this on the screen like this. So let's do more of that. I mean, uh, no, it was just like, you know, just, just like yeah. my, my sketches, my personal things. And maybe yeah. it was a vanity project because I wanted my own little book and my own little photographs that I could sit at home and look and say, oh, that was all right. 
But oh, what, what's amusing is, unlike anything else that you've put out, this is for you. And yeah. so I think that's what's interesting is what you're doing. So tell us a little about, about particularly this one over here. Well, the one on the right was probably the first one. Well, maybe both. They're both in Bournemouth, and they were both 1969, and I think two different weekends. And I was at art college in Bath, and I would hitch to the seaside, uh, uh, you know, either Bournemouth or Western Supermare or Bristol or something. And I'd spend the night on the beach and photograph. And uh, yeah, these were probably two of my very, very first photographs. Yeah, and this one, my first photograph ever. It probably, I mean, yeah, maybe that was it's actually true. a bit, but pretty close. <laughs> no, it was pretty close. I, di I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't have a camera before then. Yeah, let's do the next one. Oh, there's, these are connected. Let's tell us a little bit about these. Well, these are only in there because um, I wanted just a little... It was a personal thing. It was a big moment in my life when I, I made a documentary about the world about a, a, a boat on yeah. the Round the World Yacht Race, about the crew and how they got on on this boat. And I took a few still photographs. I re re literally only got eight photographs, and these, these are four of them. And um, I just wanted to put them in for my own personal sake. I'm not saying they're great photographs. It was just part of my life. I can't imagine. Um, now, no, let's go back. Um, so you mentioned you know, there's, not, there's not a connection uh, between these photographs and your work, with maybe one exception, which we've got on the back cover here, the next, next one right here, yeah. So tell us a little bit about this film. Yeah, but I could not not take that photograph. I put it, you know, you're really not meant to take photographs on set, so Especially maybe I'll get bonds. sued, you know. <laughs> but I mean, there's no actor in it or anything. I just thought it was such a, I just thought it was a lovely image. You know, it was really funny though, when we were, um, putting together the book, and we were talking about layout with the, um, Damiani, is they kept saying, the distributors, you know, the people that are distributing the book, keep asking, do you have behind the scene photos? Do you have behind the scene photos? And of course, that got Rogers um, back Fire. up. And you, he said, no, this isn't about movies. Yeah, no, this is something totally different. We and I don't have really many behind the scenes photographs. We really had to argue for this one, though. We yeah, I didn't. I didn't want to put it in, yeah, but I do. I do think it's kind of a fun photograph, and yeah. nobody seems to have objected. So. <laughs> and then the last one was titled "Night You Rain at the Carnival." Well, this was also round the world yacht race. We got to we got to Rio after you know, about seven or eight weeks. Sailed across the Pacific, round Cape Horn, up, up the South Atlantic. Got to Rio. And the first night we got into the dock, and the first night was the first night of carnival. So, as you can imagine, I was 26, <laughs> and I spent most of the night out on the street. <laughs> um, all right, I want to shift gears now. Um, so, yeah, we have there's a few copies out in the lobby. Um, uh, while, while you still can, I want to spend just the last few minutes shifting our gears to a film that we're gonna watch oh, yeah. tonight, um, which uh, we have some stills uh, selected here because I feel like these could have just as easily been in the book. Uh, they, you know, I feel like you could have dropped them in, not told anyone, maybe who hadn't seen the film and, and wouldn't know. And I, and I wonder if maybe for just a few select ones, if you might be willing to break down a little bit of how this got set up. I always think that's fascinating to hear a cinematographer talk about kind of the anatomy of the shot. I don't know if I can about this one. I actually don't really remember that one. Well. <laughs> okay, we got more. Oh, I remember this. Yeah. No, I remember this because it's, um, uh, what's the name? Scarlett Scarlet yeah, Hansen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because it was a long tracking shot and it was in this, uh, um, big um, store that was closed and but it was a location we didn't have anything and I remember talking to Joel and Ethan and just about putting these pianos in place and nothing else and I said it's a long track in to her playing the piano and then the most important thing to me was that practical light on the piano because I didn't 
I didn't want to um, see the whole place. All the walls are white. Um, I wanted just the feeling of darkness and just this one pool of light where this girl is playing the piano. And you're kind of drawn in like a moth to the flame to Scarlet. <laughs> I'll keep it an hour on time. We have a, few, uh, a number of more images, more than we have time to, to talk about, but let's, I just want to, and this is not ruining anything for the movie, but in the context of photography, in the context of the book, you know, I, I wanted to just put up a few of these for the next one. Um, and, and what I'm loving is I'm seeing both the humor, the irony, the contradictions um, that we see in some of your photography work. Yeah, I mean, that's coming, this is, that's coming from Joel and Ethan, you know, I mean, the, the, the juxtaposition of the props and the characters and that. Um, yeah, I mean, this kind of silhouette -y thing and the sort of darkness and the threat of the, the again, the, um, the, the uh, clothing store at night, you know, I mean, it seems quite obvious to me, really. This was di difficult, actually, oh, the, the barber shop was um, on the back lot, on the, uh, it? it's Paramount, the back lot, there was a street, and uh, we, we had one, sh one, one shop there that we um, redesigned as a barber shop, and uh, it was actually a very tricky one to light, as I remember, to get that feeling of the sunlight. Mm. Let's pause on this one. I'm going to take one last question. Uh, All right, I'll go with you. Hey, uh, so uh, I uh, just wanted to ask uh, on your comment earlier, you mentioned about how you focus on lighting and then color, you don't want color to be a uh, distraction. With that in mind, uh, what was your thought process with Blade Runner 2049 then? I mean, the colours on that are fairly well <coughs> chosen when we were talking about, when we were storyboarding it, really. Mm. I mean, we talked about Las Vegas being, I think that our inspiration was there was um, a dust storm in Australia and, and the red dust went across the opera house. And Denny said, well, you know, I think Vegas should be red uh, in contrast with his LA, which was snowy and wet and rainy and grey. So that seemed an obvious one. And then, then for the, the Wallace Tower, you know, the, um, I thought, well, this guy's, if you had all the money in the world and you lived in this terrible, dreary, snowy LA, what would you do with the interior? Uh, I said to Denny, well, what if it was patterns of shifting sunlight? So it's warm as though it's sunlight. And he said, but, Wallace is blind, and I said, well, that's even more ironic, isn't it? That's kind of, <laughs> kind of fun that he's created this kind of like sunlit world inside, and outside it's just this dreary grey. So, you know, a lot of the colours are there because the sort of, the, the story or the characters kind of, yeah, driven it, really. In this shot, um, just to close this out, um, th there's... Again, semi spoiler alert, but um, there's a line that really makes me think about your collective body of work as Team Deacons here. And, 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 and the line is sometimes you look at it and your looking changes it. You can't know the reality of what happened or would have or wouldn't have happened if you hadn't stuck your goddamn snaz in. So there is no doubt what happened. There is no knowing what happened. Looking at something changes it. And I, and I can't imagine what some of our most beloved films in cinema would be like had Team Deacons not looked at these things <laughs> <laughs> and certainly changed and, 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 and shaped us uh, in so many of the films we but have. That he is talking about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that, you know, <laughs> everything is actually a, a wave of possibility. So yeah. think about it. Anything's possible, but it's also <laughs> impossible. I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs>
So with that backdrop, please thank you for watching. I'm going to do one more thing here. Uh, we're going to try to do this each night, but we're going to actually um, capture you as a part of the Atlanta community welcoming these two here. So they're going to come down here. We're going to do a photo with everyone. So, um, so be picture ready here. <laughs> Everybody smile, don't blink. Yeah. <laughs> three, one, two, three, hold it. Good. More. All right, guys, relax a little bit. <laughs> Thank you so much. A big round of applause again for Jess Walker. We're going to take about 15 minutes before we start the main rewards of Thank you so much for coming.